Thanks a lot, Chris. Um, uh, many thanks to the organizers uh, for inviting me to this excellent workshop in this excellent place. And um, I'll be talking about work done jointly with Kambiz Ruse, my PhD student. He's here and he'll be here for the whole week. So fire as many questions as you want to either of us. Um, uh, so we are both from Cambridge. And the work I'll be presenting is uh, on the archive. This. OK, so let's start with open quantum systems. And so all of you know that a realistic physical system, which is relevant for quantum information processing, is inherently open. So it undergoes unavoidable interactions with its environment. And consequently, the resulting dynamics of the system is dissipative. And under the Markov approximation, which we know is valid when the system is weakly coupled to the environment, uh, the continuous time evolution of the state of the system is given by what is called a quantum Markov semigroup, for which I will use the acronym QMS throughout this talk. Okay, so um, all through this talk, we consider a quantum system whose underlying Hilbert space is finite dimensional. And um, in the Heisenberg picture, the quantum Markov semigroup is given by such a one parameter family of linear, <coughs> completely positive, unital maps. And they are act on operators on H. And it satisfies the following properties. Lambda zero is the identity map. It uh, satisfies such a semigroup property. And uh, also this property, which is called strong continuity. And uh, so lambda t results in time evolution over the period 0 to t. And it is unital, by which I mean that when it acts on the identity operator, you get back the identity. So this is the characterization of the quantum Markov semigroup in the Heisenberg picture. And it talk, so if you want to consider evolution of observables, this is the right characterization. But you can also look at it in the Schrodinger picture. And there it is given by a, a one parameter family of linear, completely positive trace preserving maps on the set of density matrices on H, which I denote as D of H. And here lambda star T is just the adjoint of the map lambda T for each T. That is for any density matrix rho and any operator F. This is the relation between lambda T and lambda star T for any T greater than or equal to zero. So a uh, state sigma is said to be an invariant state if it doesn't change under the action of lambda star t for all t greater than or equal to zero, as the name suggests. And this, uh, the concept of an invariant state will be crucial in this talk. So in the Heisenberg picture, uh, one can we denote by L the generator of the quantum Markov semigroup. It satisfies such a relation. And formally, one writes lambda t um, as e to the t lambda, uh, t l. And in the Schrodinger picture, one denotes the generator. We will denote the generator <coughs> by l star. Okay, this is generator in the Schrodinger picture. So uh, one important thing to stress right from the start is that we are going to restrict attention to primitive quantum Markov semigroups. That is, uh, ones which have a unique, faithful, or full rank invariant state. And that's really the premise that we can cover. And the invariant state also this talk will be denoted by sigma. Okay, so one, uh, in, an interesting problem relate, mm, concerning a primitive quantum Markov semigroup is the study of the behavior of its mixing time. But the mixing time is a time needed for the system to approach its invariant state. So the question you ask is how rapidly does the system approach the sigma? So uh, typically what you're looking for then is upper bounds on this quantity. So sigma is the invariant state and rho t is the state you get by evolving any arbitrary initial state. Okay? And so there are quantum Markov semigroups and there's a problem of studying their mixing time. But quantum Markov semigroups can be considered are in fact non-commutative generalizations of a classical Markov semigroup for which too mixing times is a well-defined concept which has been widely studied. So that would be a good starting point. So uh, it is known that uh, for studying the <coughs> mixing time of classical Markov semigroups, for which I use the acronym CMS, um, there is a uh, powerful mathematical tools, and these tools are called functional inequalities. 
And from the functional inequalities, one can derive concentration of measure inequalities, which have um, wide applications. There is also another class of inequalities called transportation cost inequalities, from which too one can get concentration inequalities. And moreover, there are relations between the functional inequalities and transportation cost inequalities. So one gets quite a nice picture with all these implications between the different inequalities. And the question that we pose is, is such a picture valid in the quantum setting when one considers a primitive quantum Markov semigroup? So uh, the outline of the talk will be as follows. I will start with the classical case, going through these different circles, explaining what they are, and giving examples of these implications. And uh, then I will move over to a quantum Markov semigroup, say what sort of quantum Markov semigroup we are considering, what our constraints are on this quantum Markov semigroup, and then discuss what are the um, relevant non-commutative generalizations of these classical concepts which we need in the quantum setting. So let's start with the classical case. So I guess all of you know what a classical Markov semigroup is, but let me denote it by PT, T, this family, uh, and it is, a, we consider it to be a primitive classical Markov semigroup on a finite space, state space. So let L be its generator and let nu be its unique invariant distribution. Uh, so assume that the uh, classical Markov semigroup is also time reversible. So there are, if a classical Markov semigroup is time reversible, then it satisfies what's called the detail balance condition. And there are different characterizations of the detail balance condition. The one which we use, uh, which are all equivalent in the classical case, but the one which we use, which is particularly useful for us, uh, um, um, because we want to generalize that to the quantum setting, is the self-adjointness of the generator with respect to a weighted inner product. Okay? So <coughs> what is this inner product? So for any f and g, this inner product is just f of omega, g of omega, nu of omega. So another quantity uh, which one can associate to a classical Markov semigroup and which completely um, characterizes it is a so-called Dirichlet form. And so the Dirichlet form is defined in terms of this weighted inner product in this manner. You will see it appearing again later on. So I said, uh, there are functional inequalities from which are used to study the mixing times. So what are these functional inequalities? So the study of functional inequalities, as all these experts in the audience know, is a vast subject. And in order to uh, define functional inequalities, you need not make any reference to Markov semigroups. But uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to talk about, consider just two particular functional inequalities in two very specific forms, and also in the context of a primitive classical Markov semigroup. So uh, for a primitive classic mar classic, uh, Markov semigroup, we generate a L, an invariant uh, distribution nu, um, a Poincare inequality with constant uh, uh, lambda positive is said to be satisfied if the following inequality is true. So I am not very good with my PowerPoint. I didn't know how to do the accents. So all the French people in the audience, excuse me for Missing the accent on Poincaré. <laughs> so um, here, uh, this is just the variance of f, and this is the Dirichlet form that you saw in the previous slide. So this is the Poincaré inequality. And the other inequality I consider is a modified log Sobolev inequality, and a modified log Sobolev inequality with constant alpha one positive is said to be satisfied if for any other distribution mu, this inequality holds. So what is this? Here, d mu nu is just the relative entropy or the kullback leibler divergence. And i nu mu is <coughs> given by this expression, which one can evaluate. And it is uh, the so-called discrete Fisher information of mu. So these are the two inequalities that I will consider, so I will label them as pi lambda, that is a Poincare inequality of constant lambda, and mlsi alpha one for a mod log, modified log Sobolev inequality with constant alpha one. 
Okay, so let me give you an example of uh, a mixing term bound which can be obtained from a functional inequality. So an example is a modified log Sobolev inequality of constant alpha 1 implies what is called rapid mixing. This was a result found by Diakonis and Salof Koste. So this was, as you saw in the last slide, the modified log Sobolev inequality, right? And uh, what they proved is that if this inequality holds uh, for a such a classical Markov semigroup, then the following uh, inequality hold is valid, where uh, mu t is the distribution obtained by evolving the initial distribution. I'm sorry, S t should be P t. I had called it S t before. That's a typo. And uh, so this shows that the, distrib the evolved distribution approaches, um, I mean, this, um, the invariant distribution. And alpha 1 is the modified log Sobolev constant. OK, so this is an example of functional inequality implying mixing time bound. OK, um, yeah, okay. could I uh, give that later on? Because uh, this is, uh, I mean, this is called rapid mixing. So maybe you cannot do better than this. So, yeah, slower than that, maybe a constant which is uh, not as good as the log Sobolev constant, alpha 1. OK, um, now I said func from functional inequalities, you can get this family of inequalities called concentration inequalities. So what are they? So let x be a random variable with uh, mm, uh, law nu and on some finite state space. And then for a function f from the state space to r, uh, a concentration of measure inequality, as you know, is a, an upper bound on the deviation of the function from its expectation value, uh, the, the probability of that with respect to the distribution nu. So uh, a Gaussian concentration is said to be satisfied if the upper bound is of this form. Here A and B are independent of R, of course. And uh, exponential concentration is said to be satisfied if instead of R squared, you have an R dependence, obviously. And these are all independent of R. So uh, an example of a functional inequality yielding a concentration inequality is the following. So you have a Poincare inequality of uh, constant lambda. And that implies exponential concentration. And so you see the, in, in the constant here, the Poincare constant appears in the exponent here. And r is the r here. And k comes from the fact that uh, what I didn't say is that uh, k, the function that you choose is a k Lipschitz function. That's why the k appears. And nu is the invariant distribution of the uh, primitive classical Markov semigroup. So this is an example. Uh, on to the next class of inequalities, which are called transportation cost inequalities. So what are they? Uh, so they look like this. So this you saw already in Jan's talk on the first day, yesterday. And it is a so-called Wasserstein distance of order p. And it is just a distance between two probability measures, mu and nu. And so the inequality, therefore, relates the Wasserstein distance to the relative entropy or kullback leibler divergence, which you know is like a pseudo distance. It's not a distance in the strict sense. So uh, let us talk about this in a little more detail. So let MD be a metric space. And let P of M be the set of all probability measures on it. And in fact, to define the P Wasserstein distance, you want this to be the set of all probability measures with finite pth moment. Then the Wasserstein distance is defined as follows. So uh, D is this metric. And uh, w what is the infimum over? The infimum is over the set of all probability measures on M cross M, whose marginals are mu and nu, respectively. So this is also called the set of couplings. Okay? So we uh, take an infimum over all these pi's belonging to the set of couplings. So this is a very nice quantity, and uh, it satisfies the properties of a distance, and it endows the uh, set of probability measures with a metric. 
So in this talk, we will be con uh, concerned with only two of these Wasserstein time distances for p equal to 1 and p equal to 2. Okay? So for p equal to 1, it becomes <coughs> particularly simple. These disappear. And this is what you get. Okay. So there is actually uh, a dual formulation of the same quantity, which ver is very useful when we want to generalize it to the non-commutative or quantum setting. And this is due to Kantorovich and Rubinstein, and so it's called the Kantorovich-Rubinstein duality. So it is given in the, in the following manner. So here you take a supremum of functions which are, uh, have a Lipschitz constant of at most one, so by which you know that this is what is meant. Okay, so this is, I'll come back to this formulation later on in the quantum setting, but for p equal to two, it, you on the other hand get, yeah, just a two and a half outside. So if M is, the under, is a smooth Riemannian manifold, then this Wasserstein distance endows the set of probability measures on it, sorry, with the structure of a Riemannian manifold. Okay, so W2 is very special. Okay, um, so the transportation cost inequalities that you saw were uh, given like this, and this was W1 and W2, and here C1 and C2 are positive constants. So you might ask, why the name transportation cost inequality? So let's make a little digression uh, to a couple of centuries back, so more than a couple. So uh, the history of this is that this arose in optimal transport theory. So in 1781, Monge, who was a civil engineer, he uh, considered optimal mass transport problem, so he, which concerns uh, the optimal way of moving a pile of soil from one location to another, and optimal in the sense of some minimal transport cost. So uh, I see the picture as digging up sand from one location and building a sand castle somewhere else. Okay. So um, Kantorovich cast this in 1942 into the following optimization problem. So he considered a cost function, which goes from m cross m to r, m being a subset of r, and two probability measures mu and mu. And this is the optimization problem that he considered. So you see you're almost in the setting of a Wasserstein distance, because as soon as you, uh, here, if you consider the cost function to be dxy to the p, where d is a distance function, then this optimization induces a metric on p of m, the set of probability measures on m, and one retrieves exactly the Wasserstein distance of order p. Okay, so this formulation that you, I gave you is due to Kantorovich, and it is often called the static formulation. There is also another formulation due to uh, Benamou and Brenier, which is called the dynamical formulation, this Wasserstein distance. And uh, that is, I'll just mention it because that was what was used in the non-commutative generalization of it, which was done by Carnel, uh, Carlin and Maas. So, uh, so Benamou and Brenier showed in the simplest case when m is, say, rd, that the Wasserstein distance of order 2 can be written as a minimization of an action integral. So let mu and nu be absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure and with respective densities, sorry, I forgot to write phi and psi, say. Then the Wasserstein distance can be written in this manner. So you see this is like a velocity term. So this is like a kinetic energy term. So the infimum is over paths uh, on the uh, set of all probability measures. And such that, so we, you consider like paths on the manifold connecting the initial and the final distributions mu and nu. And the v's are vector fields and they are connected through this equation which might look very familiar to, which is the continuity equation. Yeah? So here phi and psi are the densities corresponding to mu and nu. Okay, fine, so these are the two formulations. So uh, for a primitive classical Markov semigroup, therefore we, uh, I said that from transportation cost inequalities, one can go to concentration inequalities. And an example of this is to go from the transportation cost inequality of order one with constant C1 which is the inequality where you relate the one Wasserstein distance upper bounded by root two C1 of the relative entropy. Oh, I've got it there. 
And then, if that is true, then such a Gaussian concentration holds. See, this is Gaussian. And this was proved by Bobkov and Goetze. So the chain of implications for a primitive uh, classical Markov semigroup go as follows. If the modified log Sobolev holds with constant alpha, then the transportation cost inequality of order two holds with constant alpha inverse. And that in turn implies a Poincare inequality with constant alpha, and uh, which in turn implies exponential concentration. And on the other hand, uh, the transportation cost inequality of order two, which involves the two Wasserstein distance, in, uh, implies a transportation cost inequality of order one with this constant, which in turn implies Gaussian concentration. So that's the picture. The invariant uh, distribution, um, yeah, well, in the classical case, even all of it can be, did, you know, uh, even the modified log Sobolev and Poincare can be defined without reference to any classical, uh, to, to any Markov semigroups at all. But the way I state it like this, because when we are going to do the quantum version of it, there we really need the generator appearing in the definition of all those quantities, so as you will see. Like yeah. Without, yeah, it is just uh, for any say, um, any measure mu, you can define it as uh, lambda variance of, say, mu of f is less than or equal to f, f. So, see. No, uh, no, it, 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 E involves a uh, weighted inner product with respect to this measure mu, but this mu need not be the invariance uh, measure of a particular semigroup. Okay, so, uh, so the fact is, I said, our question was, is such a chain of implications valid in the quantum case? And uh, so let us first talk about the class of quantum Markov states that we consider. So uh, I talked about the detailed balance condition, which as you know, is to got to do with the reversibility of a Markov semigroup. And for a primitive classical Markov semigroup, we generate the L and invariant measure nu. As I said, it was given by this self adjoinedness of the generator with respect to this weighted inner product. Okay, now there are multiple ways of generalizing this in the non-commutative setting. And therefore, there are multiple characterizations of the detail balance condition. So here we're going to really follow Carlin and Mass and uh, consider two particular generalizations of it. So here now we are in the quantum case, so F and G are operators, and so they considered Two, uh, among others, they consider these two inner products. And let me say what these things are. So when you write one sigma, all you're doing is taking trace sigma f star g. And when you take half sigma, you're going to take sigma to the half f star sigma <coughs> to the half g. So obviously you see if things commute, they're one and the same. So in the classical case, they're all the same, but in quantum uh, case, they're different. And it can be shown that if the first identity holds, then the second identity holds. So therefore, we choose all through this to be our characterization of the detail balance condition, which the quantum Markov semigroup satisfies. And uh, remember, that's what it means. And we refer to this uh, ba detail balance condition as the sigma detail balance condition. So the sigma, remember, is for us the invariant state of the quantum Markov semigroup. Now, one, uh, if you have a quantum Markov semigroup, uh, there is a particular form of it, which is very popular, which is called the GKLS form, after uh, Gorini, Kosakovsky, Lindblad, and Sudarshan. And uh, a quantum Markov semigroup admits a GKLS form if it can be written in this form. So here, H is the Hamiltonian, which deals with the unitary evolution of the system. And these LJs are uh, the so-called Lindblad operators. And so the second term deals with the dissipative evolution resulting from the interaction with the environment. So uh, now uh, what was shown by Alitsky and then extended by Carlin and Maas was the fact that a quantum Markov semigroup which satisfies this sigma detail balance condition which I just introduced in the previous slide, it has a special GKLS form. So it looks like this. So you see here CJs are positive and WJs are real. 
So I'm not going to give you uh, uh, all the properties of these LJ tildes, but let me just tell you that uh, if you consider this combination, then they play the role of Lindblad operators. And uh, these LJ tildes, why do we consider this uh, um, seemingly more complicated form? That's because these LJ tildes satisfy a host of really convenient properties. They are traceless, they're mutually orthogonal with respect to the hilbert peat inner product, and most importantly, they satisfy this eigenvalue equation. So here delta sigma is the modular operator which acts in this manner. So we use, uh, make use of, therefore, um, uh, these properties. So henceforth, we consider a primitive quantum Markov semigroup with generator L, a unique invariant state sigma, and which satisfies sigma detail balance, and hence as the special GKLS form that I just introduced. So, uh, of course, the first question to ask is what is an example of this? So an example of this is the generalized depolarizing semigroup. And as you know, a depolarizing channel takes a state rho and with probability p converts it to a completely mixed state and with probability 1 minus p leaves it unchanged. So here, uh, if you consider any faithful state, any full rank state, then to it you can associate a generalized depolarizing channel for which we should thank uh, Daniel Franza for pointing us to that. So, uh, to, so to, to any such state, you can consider a depolarizing semigroup, which is one whose generator is given by this form for any f, which is an operator on H. H is the Hilbert space of the underlying system. Now, why it's not quite evident why I call this a generalized depolarizing semigroup <coughs> generator? That's because if you look at the evolution of states, then this is what it triggers. So you see, it implements a generalized depolarizing channel with uh, probability one minus e to the minus t for each time t greater than or equal to zero. So if you compare these two, you see what's the difference, why the word generalized, that instead of going to i over d, you're going to the invariant state of the quantum Markov semigroup with this probability. Okay, so this is an example of uh, clearly uh, the uh, sort of quantum Markov semigroups that we are interested in. Okay, so uh, what about functional inequalities? We want to try to pick, build up the same picture. So, uh, so quantum functionals of relevance, so uh, I won't repeat myself many t uh, again and again, but this is the scenario we are always under. So, and these are the weighted inner products that we considered, and we can consider their associated norms. So then we define the following functional. First is the quantum Dirichlet form, which I define like this. I have missed a minus sign, sorry. And with respect to this inner product, and the variance of f, and also with respect to the norm half sigma, and the quantum relative entropy, and the quantum Fisher information. Okay, right. So uh, um, it doesn't matter what uh, these exact definitions are, but what matters is what are these quantum functional inequalities. So a Poincare inequality with constant lambda is satisfied if now um, this inequality holds. And so yes, the semigroup appears through the Dirichlet form. And a modified log Sobolev inequality holds if um, this inequality holds where that's the quantum Fisher information and this is the relative entropy. So uh, here, remember, uh, what I wanted to point out is that the, in the Dirichlet form, here sits the generator and hence the semigroup uh, appears and also, sorry, I went too fast there, and that is the Fisher information defined in the previous slide. So they're really analogous to their corresponding classical inequalities. Okay, so uh, what about the other set of inequalities called transportation cost inequalities? So in order to define the classical uh, transportation cost inequalities, remember they were an inequality between the Wasserstein distance and the relative entropy. So we now need to define quantum versions of the Wasserstein distance. So uh, we start with the one Wasserstein distance and uh, we uh, keep a signature of the generator of the underlying primitive quantum Markov semigroup. So what we do is we start with the um, 
the Kantorovich Rubinstein dual formulation of it. Remember, this was it. And define the Wasserstein distance as follows. So remember, these just uh, uh, these integrals get replaced by traces. Here, nu was the invariant distribution measure there, and so here sigma is our invariant state. And here, uh, instead of functions, we have self-adjoint operators, and we need to define a corresponding quantum version of the Lipschitz norm. So the Lipschitz norm that we define is this. Now you might ask why. So uh, well, in this short talk, I can just give you at least some heuristic idea of why um, this somehow resembles the classical case. That's because if you look at the commutator LJ tilde, uh, this commutator, it can, in some sense, be thought of as a derivation. So let's just call it delta J. And why is this? Because, well, one when it's very simple thing is it satisfies the product rule, right? So this uh, commutator satisfies this product rule like a normal derivative. There we can also give another um, justification for it. But if one does that, and if one considers the omega wj's to be equal to zero and say cj to be a constant, then this is just a um, f, uh, the delta j f appearing there, right? And which therefore resembles the classical Lipschitz constant. Okay, as regards the quantum Wasserstein distance of order two, I will not talk about it. This was defined by Carlin and Mass for the particular class of quantum Markov semigroups we are considering. But let me just tell you that they considered a non-commutative generalization of the Benamou-Brenier formula, the one which we got by considering parts on the set of probability measures. The set of probability measures will be replaced by the set of density matrices, and one considers parts on them. And um, uh, but well, I won't go into the details. But now uh, that we have these Wasserstein distances, one can define transportation cost inequalities. So they are exactly analogous to the classical case, except that d rho sigma is the quantum relative entropy and not the classical one. And these are the Wasserstein distances uh, one and two that we defined, or which Carlin and Mass defined and the uh, W1 was what we defined. Now, um, uh, Jung et al. also defined a uh, quantum Wasserstein distance of order one, but in their case, uh, they, it was only for, for semigroups where the invariant state is the completely mixed state, whereas ours is in general for any state, sigma. Okay, uh, so uh, I will call this the quantum transportation cost inequality of order P with constant CP. Now, uh, what one can prove is that the one Wasserstein distance is related to the two Wasserstein distance in this manner. So D is the dimension of the underlying Hilbert space. So this lemma immediately implies that a quantum transportation cost inequality of order two implies a con transportation cost inequality of order one with C1 equal to DC2. So this is one line, because if one starts with a, um, this inequality, B, and then just uh, imposes the transportation cost inequality of order two, because that's where we start from, and which is this, this inequality for P equal to two, then you see you can just write it in this manner, with C1 is equal to DC2. So we end up with the transportation cost inequality of order one, with C1 is DC2. Okay, so uh, I said that uh, from functional inequalities and from transportation cost inequalities, you can go to concentration inequalities. And I'll give you examples of that, and I'll tell you what the quantum concentration inequality looks like. And uh, these are given in the two theorems that I'll state now. So what about in the classical case? The concentration of measure inequalities, as you saw, was always uh, bounds on such probabilities, right? And we consider the function to be, say, K Lipschitz. So in the quantum case, the analog of this is a bound on something like this, okay? So here, F are operators, in fact, self-adjoint operators, that's the SA here. And um, in particular, if G, let's consider this difference as an operator G. And if G is a self-adjoint operator, and it has such a spectral decomposition, here by QI, I denote the eigenvalues, and by pi I, the eigen uh, projections, 
then uh, this quantity which looks like the indicator function is just the sum of all the projections uh, summed over i's for which the qi's are greater than or equal to r. So, um, of course, so it, it is clear that this is the natural quantum analog because the expectation gets replaced by tra the, so the, uh, this is the analogy. I mean, it's clear to I'm sure all of you. So expectation goes over to trace of sigma times something, yeah. And uh, this i quantity plays the role of an indicator function. An expectation of an indicator function is a probability, and so we are back to the classical case. So it is, we say you have a quantum exponential concentration if you get an inequality of this form and a Gaussian concentration if you get something of this form. Here A prime and A B are all independent of R. So let me state these two theorems and I'll see whether, how much time do you have? I might try to be adventurous and prove one of the theorems, but maybe not. So the first theorem says that from uh, quantum Poincare implies exponential concentration. So this was quantum Poincare, and it implies that if F is self-adjoint, you get an exponential concentration like this. So there's an R dependence. The lambda of the Poincare constant appears here, and we will not deal too much about the constants there. And on the other hand, so this was coming from the functional inequalities to the concentration inequality, an example of it. And we can also go from the transportation inequality to a concentration inequality, which is this Gaussian concentration that you get. So if this transportation cost inequality of order one, which you know is this, relating the one versus time distance with the relative entropy is satisfied, then for any F self adjoint, you get Gaussian concentration. So R, R squared appearing for Gaussian and the C1 of the transportation cost inequality appearing. And I won't care about the other constants for the time being. So let me give you a proof idea. So both of these theorems have the same basic idea uh, behind their proofs. So the proof uh, I, um, relies on bounding the quantum moment generating function of a self-adjoint operator. So you see this is playing the role of expectation so trace sigma e to the theta f is just the moment generating function of f. So what are we wanting to bound? So we are wanting to bound this quantity in order to get a concentration inequality, right? So let us, for simplicity, consider the case when trace of sigma f is equal to zero. So then what we would want to bound <coughs> is this quantity, right? Now, by functional calculus, if you just look at this operator, it is the same as this. And it is easy to check that it satisfies an upper bound like that. Okay? So now if you multiply both sides by sigma and take the trace, you get such an inequality. And this is really just a Markov type inequality, a non-commutative version of a Markov type inequality. And the second quantity is just the moment generating function. So you see, if we find an upper bound on the moment generating function, we're done. We would have found an upper bound like that. Okay, so that's exactly what we are going to try to do. So, uh, so this is, let me just try to prove this theorem. From the transportation cost inequality of order one, I want to show that Gaussian concentration follows. So this is uh, transportation cost inequality of order one, this is Gaussian concentration. So let's start by considering an operator, which is called G, such that its trace is zero and it's uh, the Lipschitz norm of its real and imaginary part are both <coughs> upper bounded by one. So of course the trace of G sigma times gr and gi are also equal to zero. So you might be wondering why am I starting with this? It'll become clear in a minute. Uh, let's step aside and look at the quantity appearing here because we are going to assume that this inequality holds, right? So this is the Wasserstein distance. So uh, remember, this was our definition of it. So from here, of course, this is a soup, so it's greater than or equal to this quantity for any F tilde which satisfies these two conditions, right? And in particular, if F tilde has trace sigma F tilde zero, then it is lower bounded by this quantity. So what we have taken away from this little exercise is that 
for any function f tilde which is self adjoint has Lipschitz constant less than equal to 1 and trace this equal to 0, we can upper bound this by the Wasserstein distance of order 1. Now, what are we going to do with it? Go back to these functions, uh, these operators g that I've cons considered. So, a trace of g rho is upper bounded like this. And gr and gi, these quantities all satisfy these criterion because remember we chose gr and gi have to have Lipschitz constant less than or equal to 1 and of course they are self adjoint and uh, we also chose them their trace to be equal to 0. So, for both of them uh, we can upper bound it by w 1 and so we get 2 w 1 from the two of them and our premise was that we assume that the transportation cost inequality is valid. So, therefore, we get this right by the transportation cost inequality. And then there is a little bit of algebra. So, we uh, use this very useful identity and for this choice of A and this choice of B, I will skip through some uh, very simple algebra and what you end up with is just an inequality like this. So, believe me it is true, <laughs> but uh, what is nice is here Petz and Ruskai come into the game because this relative entropy can be bounded by another relative entropy which is called the maximal divergence which Petz and Ruskai introduced and which has a very, it looks uh, complicated, but it has a very convenient form. So, this quantity sitting in here, this is the maximal divergence, this is just sigma to the minus of half rho and sigma to the minus of half. Okay? So, by suitably choosing f and rho, we can it uh, amounts to something very simple and you can compute this. So, th this inequality becomes really simple, this outer inequality and you get this. So, you, we are almost there, you can recognize it right, this is just the moment generating function and what were we after? We were after finding an upper bound on the moment generating function. So, if you do things well, this is what you get. So, this is what we get, uh, I have just repeated it and remember we wanted to prove such an inequality, this is Gaussian concentration for some suitable positive constant alpha, but we chose uh, trace g to be 0 and consequently trace sigma f is also 0. So, this is what we really want to prove, but I started off by giving the key ingredient of the proof being this Markov type inequality and so, now that we have an upper bound on m f theta, we get this bound. Okay? All I have done is substituted it here. But um, uh, we want something independent of theta. So, all we want to do is to optimize this yeah? and if you optimize over theta, you find exactly this. Yeah? I have put some things under the rug, some details of Lipschitz norms <laughs> etcetera, but what you get is the Gaussian concentration. Yeah. So, three minutes uh, to summarize. Um, so, I will skip the application, sorry, can I, this does not move fast enough, it will take me three minutes to go through this, sorry, uh, do not don't look, it, uh, it, is, it will be there on the slides, there is just an application to quantum parameter estimation and uh, finite n, sorry and then I would like to, like to go to the last slide. Uh, so, for a, what we showed is for a primitive uh, quantum Markov semi group, this beautiful picture holds and uh, I did not talk about functional inequality implying the mixing bound, mixing time bound, this was proved by Castoriano and Teme. So, this chain of implications for a primitive classical Markov semi group is also valid in the quantum case and uh, this implication was also done by Carlin and Mass in the setting of a fermionic uh, Fokker Planck equation, we did it for this general class of quantum Markov semi groups and Castoriano and Teme also proved directly that you can go to quantum Poincare from the quantum uh, modified log Sobolev inequality. Now, there is this alpha sitting there and an alpha sitting here. So, just to advertise our latest paper, can we get any interpretation of that alpha? This alpha has a very nice geometrical interpretation. So, this is my last slide. So, in the classical case, there is actually, I had shown you a picture which started from the modified log Sobolev here, but there is actually a little more to the picture and the classical functional, these functional inequalities, Poincare mod modified log Sobolev and the transportation cost inequalities can all be seen to arise from a single geometric inequality and that is called the Ricci lower bound. I do not have the time to say 
what it is. But, um, and the relation between this Ricci lower bound, this geometric inequality, and this functional and transportation cost inequalities arises through a fascinating inequality which interpolates between the modified log Sobolev and the transportation cost inequalities. So it is called the HWI inequality. So let me just say why the name. So the H is actually the relative entropy which arises in the modified log Sobolev inequality. Why? Because nu is fixed, right? That's the invariant distribution. We are talking classical here. And uh, therefore, this is just a function of mu. And because of its um, similarity with the Boltzmann H functional, it is popularly called H in the literature. W, you can guess, right? It's the Wasserstein distance appearing in the transportation cost inequality. Sorry, this should be a C2. And I is this Fisher information. And what we show in our latest paper that, that this beautiful unifying picture, which brings together elements from diverse fields of maths, starting from information theory, Riemannian geometry, convexity theory, transport theory, and concentration of measure, is also valid in the quantum setting. So a lot of thanks to my brilliant PhD student, Kambiz Ruzé. And both of us would really like to thank Carlin and Mas, who are not here, because had it not been for their paper, this work wouldn't, these two projects wouldn't have been there. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>